Uh, and I just immediately fell in love with it. So, so when I was studying communications and medias and journalism, you learn a lot about sort of the, the challenges that we face as a society. And I was deeply concerned. And I know that like, given just this morning when you're sharing, sharing concerns about the environment, I heard it a few times uh, when people got up. I, I had these sort of uh, very deep concerns that are, as a society, we're not doing enough we're not thinking enough about the planet as a whole. Uh, we're treating it in very sort of immediate terms of resource extraction and all these sorts of things. So I had all these concerns and I thought, well, here I am working in the garden and working with these two people who are just doing something small, but good. Uh, and lo and behold, that sort of changed the, the whole trajectory of my life. So I started woofing on that farm and then I did it on a few other farms in Australia. It was, this is a long story because a lot of my twenties was traveling around and, and experiencing different cultures. Um, but I, I just realized I needed that, that connection, hands in the soil. Um, and when I came back home, I started thinking about what does that look like here? What can I do? Because I did a different, a bunch of different models. So, Fast forward a few years, and I, I went out to the West Coast, British Columbia, as we spoke about in my, in my introduction, and I was tree planting out there. And I had heard about these market gardens that are quite common on the West Coast of Canada. So that's the scale and size that really ranges from about one to five acres in that range. So five acres for a market garden would be on a large scale. Most are about one or two acres. Um, so the idea with that is you're growing as much food as you can coax out of a small plot of land. So there's a lot of planning that goes into it. It's, uh, it's a lot of spreadsheets at this time of year trying to figure out how I can take this one bed. So it's a three foot bed by say 30 or 45 feet long. How many times, how many crops can I plant in that in the season and do it in a way that I'm building the soil um, rather than just extracting from it. So I started farming on small farms out west. And there's a saying out west that like, or when you come back home, everybody's like, oh yeah, they've been on the west coast. It's like, it's so progressive. They're 10 years ahead of what we're doing here in Ontario. And at least in the small scale farming community, that was very true. So out there, I was, I was learning from so many great different farmers who were, everybody does something a little bit differently. Um, but it was so well supported by the community. So I think you guys probably feel that here with, with what the Unitarian Fellowship is, uh, it's building community. And I was seeing that, I, I kind of had a hunger for that myself because I was raised in the Catholic church and we had a community there, but like, it just wasn't for me. I didn't feel a connection to that, but I found this community around the farm and around the farmer's market. So every Saturday we'd go to farmer's market there and they were they were just bustling like everybody in the community it felt like came to get their vegetables from the farmers at the farmers market they all knew their names they all knew the kids that you know the farmers knew the kids the kids knew the farmers they give them a carrot or a tomato and it was like this is something tangible and there's no dogma there's no religion there's, there's just people who are coming out to get good clean produce that was thrown the right way by these farmers and i loved it and i was like this is this is something that i can get involved in so I'm originally from Windsor. That's where I grew up. Long story of how it all came that I, that I came to Sarnia. But my best friend, Kyle, um, he had moved here and bought a four acre property. Um, so he, he, he's not a farmer. He, him and his, his partner, Katie, they both work full time jobs. So I had the opportunity to start Taproots in 2018 on that plot of land which was great because I didn't have any money <laughs> and not being born into agriculture, I didn't have any access to land otherwise. Um, so we started the farm on a complete shoestring and I brought some slides to kind of show that progress. So I hope this works, but I didn't really see. Yeah, here we go. So this is, this is like day one on the farm uh, in 2018. So as you can see, it's just an old, it was just grass. So we had to take, we got the sod cutter, we cut the sod off, we rototilled it, and we had a blank slate, essentially. Um, so the work to build the farm, uh, it took a long time. <laughs> it took, you know, six years to get us to where we are now. We started with less than a quarter of an acre. Uh, here you see Maureen, that's Leah's mom. Leah's my partner. 
Maureen was essential, especially in the early years to get the farm started up. Uh, so we rotated tilled the land, we tarped it, and we kind of tried to like just let the weed seeds die out. So you'll see that in some other photos. There's when you take the tarp off, you can see some of the residual grass and the weeds. Um, and this is Kyle. Kyle's out there shaping beds with a, a tool called the Tilly. It's a really neat tool. It's battery operated. Uh, so all of our beds are hilled up. Uh, that helps when you get big rains so your, your crops don't flood out. So there's now 134 beds on the farm. Uh, they're either 30 feet long or 45 feet long. And every one of those was shaped with that tool that you saw in the previous photo. Um, so it's a lot of work. Uh, you can see the soil is now much darker. That's because we brought in a heck of a lot of compost. Um, some of the farm that we've expanded to was on conventionally uh, sourced land that was used, used to be big tractor farming. Um, so the, the soil was really compacted. So it takes a lot of work to try to build that up. So we bring in a lot of compost each year. Here's me, I'm seeding uh, some of our first crops uh, with the Jang seeder there directly into the soil. Uh, that's the farm, the totality of the farm in year one. So it's less than, it's quite a bit less than a quarter of an acre. Uh, it was just pretty much me, Leah and Maureen who were tending it. I also worked at the Groots for the first two years that I was doing the Groots in the morning and then the farm in the evening. And it was like seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Um, it was hustling. Uh, so you can also see in that photo, you see the, the insect covers over the top, as we mentioned uh, in the, in the uh, bio, it's a chemical free farm. So one of the things that we do is we try to prevent the bugs from getting on onto the crops in the first place. So we use a lot of that insect netting over uh, crops with pest issues. Here's us at our first ever farmer's market uh, back in 2018 under the bridge in Point Edward. Uh, we didn't have really any produce ready, so we just went out there because we had already paid for the slot. So I was like, I'll just go out there and chat with folks and tell them, tell them what we're doing. Uh, and then, you know, as the produce started coming on, we started selling a little bit here and there. But the first year was just farmer's markets. It was just going out there and trying to meet the community, explain who we were, what we were trying to do, and, and build up some excitement about it. So this is maybe two weeks later. We have our first carrots on. We've got the got some tomatoes coming in there and we're off to the races. So year two, we put up our first structures on the farm. So our first hoop house went up in, uh, in year two and that changes things a lot because you get an early start in the season and you go late in the season as well. Uh, and you can see here that was just a regular farmer's field, conventional agriculture. It was the traditional uh, corn, soy and wheat. Uh, I think it was corn the year before we did that. So that's in year two. We've got the first hoop house built. Uh, there's now four hoop houses on, on the property. So we've built one pretty much every year since the first. Uh, and it allows us, like, as I said, a uh, season extension, uh, which is really important. Here's Maureen and Leah uh, planting our first garlic crop. So we do a lot of garlic on the farm now. That's planted in the fall. And we put the, uh, the straw over the top of it uh, to insulate it over the wintertime. Here's me and Leah building the second uh, second structure. So you can see that's this is another thing we do to try to promote uh, biological activity in the soil. You, all that green looks like grass is a wheat crop, winter wheat. So that's called the cover crop. It's not commercially viable, like you don't sell it. The idea is you grow it and then you return it to the soil and it becomes worm food, essentially. So you're building up your soils that way. <laughs> We've done a lot of trial and error on the farm. This was in the very early years before we had hoop house structures built. We did them just really tiny ones over the top. And I'm quite a tall guy. So getting in there to, uh, to, to harvest was not so fun. We don't do that anymore. But in the early years, we were trying everything. We we're trying to keep as much product as we could as long as we could uh, out in our fields. And you can see in the wintertime, we even had them as well. Uh, here's my friend Greg. Early years again, we didn't have any hired staff, so it was like friends and family on board all the time. As much help as we could get, we'd take. So Greg's on a tool there called the broad fork, and you can see the little divots it makes uh, in the soil. So essentially, you're taking that tool. It's got 12-inch tines on it, and every six inches down the bed, you're just opening up the soil so air and water can penetrate deep to the roots where the plants will be. Um, that's done on every bed on the farm every spring. Uh, until we're happy with the tilth of the soil. So it's a good workout uh, and it gets us in shape pretty quick uh, in early spring. 
So this would have been, I think, the farm year three when we're putting up the second structure. And uh, that's Leah and Maureen. They're using some of our small scale hand tools. Uh, this is before we had a two wheel tractor to use to, to develop the soil or a little tractor that we now use. Uh, but it was start small and, and reinvest into the farm. So each year that we made a little bit of a profit, we put it back into the farm to make things easier for us uh, and more efficient. This is a, if you can see that little black speck, that's called a flea beetle. Uh, flea beetles are a real problem, a, a, a real pest problem on the farm. So that is exactly what we're talking about with uh, the insect netting. So we want the beetles on the net and not on the crops because they'll eat your holes in your crops. And then and not that the crop is not edible, but it's uh, people buy with their eyes essentially, right? So you don't want to try to sell a crop <laughs> with a bunch of holes in it. It doesn't sell as well at farmer's market. Uh, this is the wheel hoe. Uh, a wheel hoe is just another uh, very small scale unmechanized tool that we use to cut out old crops like that salad there before we turn the beds over. Here's our seed starting, how we used to do it in, in our house <laughs> in the basement. Uh, we, would, we would start all the seeds and then move them out to our, our crop house, which we now have. Uh, we now have a much bigger one, so we can do a lot more seed as the farm has scaled. We had to build, build a new crop house last year. Here's some of the spreadsheets, as I said. So this is like planning that I do in December. So everybody's like, well, it must be great being a farmer because you get to take the winters off. But really, no, there's not that much downtime uh, because to do a farm on a small scale takes a lot of planning. So uh, that's that spreadsheet there takes me pretty much all of December to figure out what's going where. Every bed is accounted for and can be planted up to four times in a season. Uh, so it's a lot of planning. The dates are all in there. When I have to start the seed, when I have to transplant the seed, et cetera. And from that, I, I purchase the seeds based on the estimations of how much we'll need. Here's Lee and I uh, transplanting some romaine lettuce. You can see that we plant it onto landscape fabric. So that has become essential, especially as we've grown. Uh, because on an acre of land with three people essentially running it, uh, weeds can get away from you really quickly. So the landscape fabric uh, has the holes in it so you can plant the crops, but then you don't have to worry about the weeds overtaking the crops. The other really nice thing about it uh, is that our, we're on drip irrigation. So there's irrigation lines that run underneath the landscape fabric, and that's feeding the water directly to the roots of the crops. Uh, and it's really nice because you don't have to lose any of that water to evaporation. And as you can see from these photos, we're really exposed out where the farm is, like there's no wind breaks at all. So when we used to do overhead irrigation, if you had a windy day, like we often get out there, your sprinkler head is maybe hitting half of your crop and then the other half's going onto the path. So with drip irrigation, we don't have to worry about that. It also conserves about 50% of the water usage you would otherwise be using. So it's all these little tricks that we've learned over the years. So now you can see like pretty much every crop we can grow on the landscape fabric is grown on landscape fabric. And in the early years, we didn't have a lot of money. So we had to buy the cheap stuff. Now we're in a bit of, a bit of a better financial position so we can buy the stuff that last. Because we're environmentalists first and foremost, we didn't like throwing away plastic waste. Um, so the stuff that we use now is rated for about seven years if you keep care of it. Lots of lettuce, that's our primary crop. Um, we do run a CSA program. That's primarily how the farm is funded. So CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It's essentially a veggie bag program. So every uh, week for 20 weeks throughout the growing season, starting in June and going all the way through October, uh, if you sign up with us now, you're guaranteed a bag of fresh, fresh produce, anywhere from six to 10 vegetables, depending on what's in season. Um, so that's our, our primary way we fund the farm. We also do a farmer's market now just in Bright's Grove on Wednesday evenings. Uh, we do a farm shop, as Alan was mentioning, he orders through us online and you can come pick up right at the farm. Uh, we have a cooler out front in the farm stand that has a bag with your name on it, your order, and a nice little thank you note at the bottom if you come to support us that way. Uh, and we also do a few restaurant clients, some small caterers. So we're diversified. It's a lot of juggling. Uh, it gets really busy in the, in the summertime. 
Here's us in the hoop house. That's our two wheel tractor. That's what we use now primarily to work the soil. Uh, it's a lot more efficient than some of the smaller hand tools we use, but it does require gasoline to run. So there's trade offs, of course. Compost, compost, compost. Each year we're bringing in about 60 yards of compost to, uh, to address the beds and to build them up. So especially where they were devoid of much nutrients um, from conventional farming, we use a lot of compost on those new beds. So we had to buy a little compact tractor to get that around, <laughs> around the yard because in the early years it was shovel into a wheelbarrow and then you're running it, you know, a few hundred feet. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, not only a huge time suck, but it's also a lot of work. So that's me very happy. You can't see how big my smile is. In the photo, <laughs> I was really happy to get that tractor because it saves your back a lot in the springtime. There's the broad fork. That's the tool I was talking about. And this is the beds that we just built last year. As you can see, that's sort of our starting point. Uh, not a whole lot happening in that soil. That was chemically farmed for years. So it was... No, it's it's heavy clay and it was really compacted because you could see you know the big tractor driving over the top of it. So we want to try to open that soil up, and that's where the broad fork comes in. Those are the beds after they've been rototilled and hilled. So that's the blank slate, and then we're going to bring the compost on, and then we're going to plant. So to make new beds in the, in year one is the most work, and then each year it gets a little bit easier, uh, and we try to till it a little bit less. So that's the farm this year, actually. That was just before I built the house. So now there's a third house in the middle of those two. Tomatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes. We grow a lot of tomatoes in the summertime in the hoop house structures. There's me very proud of those tomatoes. It looks like a beautiful set there. Um, 700 tomato plants in our hoop houses. So it's a, it's a really big summer crop for us. It takes about four hours of work just to prune them each week. Um, and these are young plants. They're maybe uh, two months old. Uh, but they are indeterminate, so they'll grow all the way to the top of the structure, which is 10 feet tall. Uh, and then you prune them each week, so they'll be naked about halfway up the plant. The idea is we plant them really close together, so we want to promote airflow. Uh, and that way, you're much less likely to suffer blight, which is what typically kills tomatoes in this area. How are we doing for time? Am I okay? Five minutes? Okay, I think we're getting towards the end of the slides anyway. So this would be maybe the uh, beginning of August and July, something like that. Tomatoes are getting pretty tall, at least tall, as tall as I am. Uh, you can see the, the peppers have just gone in there, late season peppers as well. Here's some uh, zucchinis, same idea. Zucchinis are planted on the landscape fabric. So it really minimizes the amount of weeding we have to do. Uh, that's the trellises we use for cucumbers. So the cucumbers have just gone in there. Uh, it's a very simple trellis system with T posts, a plumbing T on the top, and electrical conduit that ties the structure together with the Hortonova netting. Here's our garlic, 2,500 heads we did this year on a small scale. So that was a, that was a lot to process, <laughs> to clean and process. We built this little garlic wall, which is a pretty neat way to dry it. Uh, that wasn't my idea initially. I saw another farmer do it and I copied it, but it worked really well. Uh, because to hang all that from the rafters, it takes a lot of time, which is how we used to do it. But we, when we scaled it, that was the easiest way. We tried mushrooms this year. Mushrooms is really neat. Uh, we love eating mushrooms. Lee and I are vegetarians, so mushrooms are a big part of our diet. Um, we tried these outdoors. There's a few different varieties that will grow successfully outdoors. These are called wine caps. They were the, uh, the best of the bunch that we tried. We also did oyster mushrooms and shaggy beans. Um, mushrooms are an amazing thing. I'm not going to go too much into them, but like to have mushrooms in your garden, uh, it really increases soil health. That mycelium that's working, we don't even know all about it. I mean, the, the science is, is, I would say, pretty, is not that advanced as, as far as mushrooms go. But I, I mean, I just feel like when you see mushrooms pop up in the garden, you got some pretty healthy soil. And that's us. That's the end of our season. This is Megan. Megan uh, worked for us the past two years. Uh, she was amazing. She's going actually going to go out west this year uh, to work on some farms out there, which uh, sucks for us because she's so good. But um, she's she's really keen to to broaden her horizons as a market gardener and and thinking she might want to do it as a career herself, uh, which would make me pretty happy because I think we need more young farmers uh, in the game doing it on a small scale uh in an ecologically friendly way so that basically wraps up my presentation i'll, I'll leave the last couple of minutes